Mm, yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh, and boy, boy, I love it, love it. Yeah, I love it, love it. Yeah, I love my HBCU. Yeah, and man, man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Mm, yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I tune into the ACCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. Yeah. If they lost, yeah. I'm quiet as a mouse. Yeah. But if they won, she tab. Yeah. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab. Mike Washington and Charles Bishop, they're out on assignment, but I have the other great team that gets it done on Sports Wrap. That is A.D. Drew, who's here with me in Atlanta. And we got Brian Fulford that's going to play the role and get it done as well. With that being said, I just got was able to get out of Houston, so I want to say prayers to all those affected by the storm. Uh, a lot, including myself, um, well, houses are without electricity. I actually sent my wife and son to Waco to my parents' house, so they're safe. Um, we will have to get the groceries. I think my wife was upset because she bought all the groceries just for the storm. Now that's gone. So you know, gotta have coolers for today like that. <laughs> I think it'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be. So we do have a big cooler, you know. So at least the meat. Yeah, we had generator and all that generator uh, wasn't working, so I gotta go get another generator. Anything. So I got out Sunday night, flew to Dallas. I say the night in Dallas, then got out. Uh, on Monday to get to Atlanta. So I've been here since Atlanta. Still doing my dean work. So I'm calling everything, getting updates from the provost and the president's office, making sure all the faculty are aware. So we've been closed to let you know how things are affected that now. We have been closed Monday and Tuesday. And now just got the message I sent that out before the show that we're actually be closed tomorrow. During the summer months, we don't have Friday. So it's one day. I wouldn't be surprised if they show up down. a week down and let it start up. It's intriguing when you talk about being the dean and the academic side, you been, you know, a professor. Grades were due for the first time uh, in on Tuesday. We have to push that, separate that, because while we had some professors that had their grades in uh, before they moved around, other professors don't have electricity to get grades in. So um, we're going to have to make means to make that happen. But we're here. We're going to give you a show. We're going to get into it. We got some news. Uh, we have some uh, tragic news uh, that I want to get out here first before we get into some of the meat while we're here in Atlanta for the SIAC football media day that kicks it off uh, for the three other HBCU football conferences. Obviously, we have a fourth other conference, but uh, the G, the HBCU AC. I See, myself, got the G. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. As they the good is <laughs> <laughs> Do not play football as they leave. Um, and they don't have any members that actually have a football no. team. Think about it. Florida. We've only, Florida. We've only got two NAIs. Yeah, play in Langston. Yeah, and they're not part of the league, so their league content is like that. But with that being said, we have the tragic news: former Bowie State football player. One of the three uh, were killed in a car crash, as reported from HBCU Sports. Former Bowie State football player A.J. Linton was identified as one of the three men who perished following a car crash in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Linton transferred to Bowie State before the start of the 2023 season after spending a year at Penn State, two years at Florida State. Many people know by now Linton was one of the three passengers in the car along with the 2024 Minnesota Vikings draft pick Kyrie Jackson and the former University of Maryland football player Isaiah Hazel. Three men were all teammates and former football members of the Wise High School football team uh, that graduated one year apart. So um, I know you all got a chance to talk about this Sunday, so we we'll to get into thoughts and you already shared that. Uh, but I thought it was appropriate, like we like to do, particularly on this show, is we'll take a moment of silence uh, before we uh, move on with the rest of the show.
with that being said, I'm going to go to you, A.D., since you're my partner right here as we get into it. Um, what are some other news and thoughts? I know the big thing is SIEC, but we're going to take some major time to really get in these predicted order of finish, my predicted order of finish, see any surprises, discrepancy in there, get your thoughts on this. Obviously, you're the SIE guru. We'll get Brian to get in here and get his thoughts on the SIEC how it's going to shake out, what he wants to see in the media day, what questions he wants to answer. So we're going to really give you in depth. And be prepared. Tomorrow we'll do a live show from inside um, the College Football Hall of Fame in Atlanta. We're literally across the street Yes, in the hotel there, so it'll be easy for us to jump up, get up, and walk on over there to the event. But with that being said, what other news that you want to share maybe get into before we get in depth into the SIC? And I must say, I like the fact that you are branded really well. And we had a sign up here, you got the cap. I was able to get my shirt on, make sure people understand, fully engaged SIEC uh, this week as we get into it. Curtis, hey, it must Curtis be nice. It must be nice to have an embroiderer that you guys know about. Man. Where, 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 where? Hey, courtesy of Dr. Holliman. Dr. Holliman hooked the brother up. Yep. Yep. Back to a spring sports championship. Uh, time. Yeah, it's good to know the commissioners. <laughs> good to know yeah, people. Good to yeah, know people. Yeah, they the work you're doing. Go over to AD and grab you one of them hands. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had two, I had a choice of two colors. So there you go. So I got the universal one. I got the white one. I could wear the white one with everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, before I get into my story, uh, shout out to uh, the two people whose name are on the show and in the jingle, uh, brother Bishop and the brother Washington. Uh, I know Charles was still uh, making an attempt to get here to Atlanta. He had plans to be here. And, and at this point, today. he's scheduled to get out. He's sending so, the data. He's scheduled to get out. Yeah. So if nothing changed with the airlines, he'll be here this evening, later this evening. Right. So I'm looking forward to seeing him. I uh, hope that he's got his family taken care of. Same thing with uh, Brother Washington and uh, G. G. No lights. G. No lights. No lights. <laughs> it's got it's to be tough. It's got to be tough. That's all I can A little say. bit of this fence was shaking up. Yeah. Um, but that's a lot of what's going on there. Trend, tree limbs are down. Uh, some folks really got it tough with those tree limbs. You man, you had trees that fell on houses and cars. Obviously, pretty much everybody I talked to, the worst that you saw is they had fence damage. Correct. Some people with some roof repairs, uh, where they literally had to talk over the roof. Some of them will have just adjustments, but most of the folks that I know um, were sparred some of the big things. Good stuff you get out there when you talk about Biden. Uh, he's already signed the relief. Uh, in regards to Texas, it's amazing uh, how governors and AGs uh, they don't have a problem with big government when it's they when state they, in, when they say they're in an uh, emergency. Uh, All of a sudden, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, please sign on, Mister Republican, Mr. Democrat. <laughs> anyway, let's get to this news, uh, Doctor Kabir. Uh, uh, while everybody is looking forward to next week, I'm gonna jump to next week with the SWAC Media Day. I want y'all to pay attention to something else that's happening on SWAC Media Day and then the following day when we'll be focused with our attention on the VX SWAC Challenge press conference, something that's happened on those two days. Grambling University uh, women's basketball player Brenda McKinney is on the verge of a deposition stemming from a federal class action lawsuit she filed against the NCAA in 2023. In the suit, McKinney accuses the NCAA of discriminating against HBCU institutions through its academic reform program. McKinney argues that the NCAA included metrics in its academic performance program, APP, that it knew would have discriminatory effects on its HBCU members. This is why I brought up those two days. The NCAA requested to delay the lawsuit, but U.S. Magistrate Judge Mark J. Densmore denied the request and set a deposition for McKinney on July 17th, the day after SWAC Media Day for all those who will keep it up with it. Coincidentally, that happens to, to fall just a day after a settlement conference that is scheduled for July 16th, SWAC Media Day. Coincidence, y'all. Judge Densmore wrote in his order, while defendants' failure to have co completed the plaintiff's Deposition prior to the scheduled date of the settlement conference may well be a failure to properly plan its necessary discovery. It is neither good cause nor extension circumstances. 
Now, I want to get everybody's thoughts on this, but I want to level set some stuff. One of the things that's tough about the NCAA, they have not been successful in their lawsuit. Okay. So that's something to keep your eye on. That whatever has come to most judges now, just the way the NCAA has operated, they have not won, which is fascinating that they decided not to throw it out. So that's the one that will give me pause and understanding. This is something I've heard about in terms of academic studies, that this is some issues they've been out there. So there's some studies that kind of support this. Two, I've heard that the different law groups were looking at this, and they were just waiting on a student plaintiff that would be interested in sign on to go through the process. Kind of the role of so, parks of the situation. Exactly. So they've been working through this for a process for a while to get somebody in there. So they've had their homework. They've lined up. They're pretty good about it. We interviewed in terms about who they have lined up for the best position. Then I got some calls and never could work out the scheduling time uh, to get into this brief. But um, this is pretty significant and serious. It's really fascinating to kind of see where this goes. If any other uh, students jump on, the sign on will be interesting. Some things to kind of think about as you look through this. Uh, let me go to you, Brian, to kind of get your thoughts. And then we're going to come back, AD, and just get your thoughts after coming. Kind of bringing it to the table for us to discuss. Uh, Brian, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, um, I, well, I, mean, I I don't have much to add, to be honest. I mean, I, I think, you know, we talked a little bit about it on uh, Sunday. I, I think we just have to kind of wait uh, to see where, where everything goes. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a – I think a lot of the issues that have been stated regarding APR are well known. Um, I, I guess I would I would love to to see exactly what specifically is being alleged. You know what what from what I can tell, what they're specifically saying is that the NCA went into this and knew that it would have this parent effects more than any other group of HBCU. That's One thing that's interesting is because I know previously uh, that a president of Texas Southern University, that he actually went to the NCAA when they first started off the APA rule. And there were some adjustments made because of the concerns he put up in were about APC. This was President Rudley of Texas Southern University when it first hit. And he really hit hard and had some words, my understanding, when he was on that committee it really were about how this was going to affect those. And they took some automatic relief then. They, since then, they actually did some other types of relief. They created an NCA uh, program that helped financially some institutions APR. So there's some recognition by the NCA based on this. At least you could argue that they understood that there was going to be some differential treatment in regards to HBCUs. So obviously, not a judge, not a lawyer, but it's going to be fascinating to see how they argue this and what does the judge feel about when some of these things are likely to be put on the table. So I would, I would, I, okay, so in, in hearing that, I would, the analogy that comes to my mind here, uh, and it's almost like you're looking for a smoking gun to prove intent. You know, did the NCAA intentionally create this program knowing that it would affect HBCUs. It, it's almost, yeah. it, it yeah. might even be similar to an argument, watch this here, that the cigarette industry knew that when they were creating cigarettes, that it was going to create bodily harm to the lungs and other things. Or, you know, why did they create cigarettes? You know, why did they market them the way they marketed? Did they know that cigarettes were going to kill people? Now, I think it's been proven that, yes, they they did know that. Uh, <laughs> at least they knew that there would be health risk uh, and they still continue to market and sell them. So I guess that, you and know, I don't know. The other part if, of that, and to your point, which is even the second layer of that, once you learn that, let's say that for whatever reason you may not have known it ahead of time. Right. But at some point but, you, consequence. but at some point you do learn that this is a thing. And the question is, is what did you do to remediate it once you learn? Did Correct. you hide the information? 
Right. You really push it out there. Cigarette industry. Right, <laughs> right. Which is what really hit home for the cigarette industry is the fact that at some point they knew it, that there were studies out there and they did some of the, like their own studies and they didn't do anything about it. So you're absolutely right. It's not only if you knew from the forefront, but at some point and you learn, did you make any changes? No. I'll hold my thoughts out for the break. Okay. Let's get into, well, go ahead. We got a little time. Let's get, give me your okay. thoughts. All right. And then we'll be, make a clean sweep. Okay. You know, I'm looking at this and this almost takes me back to the 80s, Dr. Kabil, mm. when Proposition 48 came up. And that was, you know, you had to have a standardized ACT or SAT score. I believe it was 16 or 18 back then. And I remember it started moving up throughout the year. On the surface, it sounded good. But the unintended consequence of Proposition 48 oh, yeah. were, were the athletes who were not prepared coming out of their high school uh, because they didn't know how to deal with this were ineligible had to sit out a year. Unintended, in, unintended consequence. They, they made adjustments, still didn't make the proper adjustments. And ultimately, finally, finally, after all those years, went away, went away from from the Proposition 48 uh, thing. Think about that. I think about this in relationship to APR and how HBCUs, uh, when you always look at that 930, how many, how many sports within the HBCU below it. fall below that 930 in comparison to our non-HBCUs. And the HBCUs have tended to score lower than other MSI. Minority serving institutions for those who don't uh, who don't understand that vernacular. But I do wonder this: in today's woke society, or don't say woke society, and depending on which state you're in, with the DEI or anti-DEI, I wonder if anywhere in here you're going to hear the DEI argument that if you if you lower this standard or change the standard for HBCU, now you're placating to yeah. the DEI movement. I wonder if that's going to come in here and in any type of way. This is something I did not think about Sunday, but it's something that I thought about subsequent to that. And especially as you think about not only the DEI but the uh, Project 2025 and all these other things that are happening in, re in the real world, uh, us and conservative Supreme Court, if this thing winds up there. I think that's a good point. I think when you get into it, the question is, it really the DEI come up? But I think the further question before that will really comes up then what that comes up is, is why did you implement this in the first place? Uh, I think the, I think the intentions were, were initially good and probably made academic. Well, I, I think it's I don't know I won't say how much it was good because that was probably what they were desired to do. Yeah. But I know in a lot of ways the movement was kind of after Prop Forty Eight, those kind of things. Yeah. The real intention was is they were getting a lot of negative press that you had a lot of athletes that were going in this case to be Power Five, Power Six at the time. Yeah. BCS schools. Um, the ultra uh, marketed branded institutions where you and, had and, I learned that. and they weren't graduated. Yeah. So this was in defense of trying to get ahead from a really a marketing standpoint that the NCA was doing initiatives to try to make sure that these players were actually graduated. Well now the question that comes in was that really taking place? Were these just markers that allowed you to market further? Did it really change the graduation rate? You look at the graduation of the head of them. Yeah. One, one last comment. This significantly right. is anti what at least our state institutions were created for as far as to take the, those, those yeah. students that were may have not been prepared, could not get into a University of Alabama. Uh, University of Texas, uh, Texas. Well, I, I will say we need to be careful with some of that because some of those schools 
later change their entry requirements. Those schools also oftentimes the state institution were open to uh, students that didn't meet certain metrics, right. and, and not they, oh, including African Americans, because if you go back, and further, we know we need to remedial. We know you're gonna need to remedial classes. To right, but I'm saying people. when you talk about Texas A&M, when it was open, it was an ag school. It yeah. was open for uh, those Florida State. It was just open for males, but it was not open in terms of where they are now, where you have a very exclusive class, where they looking to be a part of the. Um, Ivy type elite AA right. American universities or your doctoral research one institution. Oh, yeah. They were not originally like that. So sometimes we got to be careful in terms of history of where they were originally when these things started. But what's the intent? With that, let's take our first break before we get too lost in this great information. <laughs> and we'll come back on the other side. Uh, we're going to get into the SIEC for the second half of the show. But there was one uh, question out there that I thought y'all did a great job that we might revisit a little bit. We got some general updates, and I thought uh, the discourse y'all had on the North Carolina Central uh, discussion and somebody in the chat asked to talk about it a little bit. But that being said, we'll be back after our first break, maybe touch on that a little bit, take a second break, and we'll get in a full framework of the SIEC uh, with these key players of the year announcements. I got over to the ALOF. Uh, and got to talk with the coaches and players, and uh, they did some uh, work in, in terms of volunteer work, really good in terms of the food bank here. So we excited about what's going on. Got to talk to a lot of the coaches, ADs, that really were excited that I was here and gave me some kudos. So uh, as always, Black College Sports Network is in the house. Inside the HBC Sports Lab is in the house. Sports Wrap is in the house. We're going to give you your best insight into – the ACC sporting uh, culture, as well as, as I like to call it, sporting exclusive diet, but if you don't see any place else, stick with us. We'll be right back after this first break. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and parenting education coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowerment J-A-X. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational, powerhouse, intelligent, and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K-E-A-V-E-R-S-V-O-I-C-E dot com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Nope. Nope. Want him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www. Slowburnwaco.com Compress the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team If they wanna love ya And who the ball, who the ball So listen to Professor Yes sir, yes sir And pay attention Boy. Cause he gon' teach a lesson yes. This is Dr. Mills inside the HBC Sports Lab With A.D. Drew here uh, Right here as we're getting it done in Atlanta And we have Brian Fulford joining us Part of the team Lonnie Shaw put out there, what's up with uh, athletic financial woes in North Carolina Central? I think he might be talking a jab as he's from Norfolk State, but in all seriousness, uh, we can talk about these things and get more information out there, particularly since we had an update since Sunday when you all talked about it in a group where y'all really had some discussions. And I thought Brian put a 
great point out there. And I think people may have thought about it literally when it's zero, but he wasn't saying zero in act of zero money, but there were money coming in. But his point was, if you're not fulfilling the opportunity as the athletic department institution, but you'll bring a company in, and that puts you in a different position when you're negotiating. Hey, wait, I think AD had a counter to that that I thought was really point I must add at the time I was reading more with you. But there, there, <laughs> there is something different when <laughs> when you have the negotiation if one organization is doing all the work and then when the institution is doing the work. I thought Brian came back with a retort that I, I thought had some merits in saying, hey, you're you're putting all this stuff together so there's still some work that Pete has to do. Which I'd like to say is really a great discussion to find the details. And I don't know if we're able to do that. If you're not careful, you get mired in the details when you really don't have enough information to kind of find those things out, which both of y'all were saying that you look into. Well, since then, we've had the former athletic director, Dr. Ingrid McCree, that I thought did a really important update and giving some more autonomy of what athletic directors have to deal with many of them can't talk about because their jobs on the line but the challenges that ad vp of athletics have in terms of working within the system of trying to better their organization better their institution right and oftentimes as fans those that don't know we oftentimes will go in the athletic director and say, you got to do more, you got to do better. Uh, but I thought it was fascinating. I know we don't have time necessarily to read all that. But I thought it was important, if you'll read here, where she, Dr. Ingrid McCree, puts in and talking about how that this was not something like the AD just signed off, or as you all talked about, that a legal counsel had to read this. The president, for the most part, had to sign off at some point. And even, I think, one of you talked about, if not both, in a board. I said that. Right. Yeah. Sign off on it. Yeah. But she went even deeper. And so read that line just for those that hadn't caught this on HBC Game Day. Yeah. If you haven't, go check it out because it's a great information. It's a great article. And uh, actually, Brian is the one who uh, sent this to me earlier today. So thank you for uh, sending it to me while we're on the road, Brian. You know, kind of hard to uh, drive and read in the rain. Uh, I ain't say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but one key, one key point in here. The state purchasing bid process engages the department, the athletic department, uh, finance and administration, legal counsel, the chancellor, or the president, depending on what system you're in, but in their case, the chancellor, and the board of trustees for selected bid. This goes for all major contracts agreements to include employee contracts. Multiple conversations with involved stakeholders before approvals are made. ADs manage a diverse population of constituents daily trying to bring harmony to all. It's a tough job. And there's one other one I want to bring out after we talk about this. All right. Yeah, and I was going to say, she talked about it wasn't all just me, which I thought was a really good point. I'm going to go to you, Brian, and since you kind of forward and read through it, uh, does this change any of the thought process that you had from Sunday or does it add to it? Well, I, I, you know, I'll be honest. I, I was reading Stephen, uh, Stephen Gaither's article, uh, with the response from peak sports attorney. That's I haven't seen that one. You, oh, you haven't seen that? No, I didn't see that. that oh, one. Oh yeah, yeah. That that now that's juicy. Now you want you want the you want we we can talk the we can talk about the sexy like the conversation we were having earlier, Doc. Can we we can talk about the sexy story or we can talk about the uh, the 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 good uh, it, it, the, the 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 story that 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 you got right there. The sexy one the response by Pete. In my go opinion. ahead and give us a little bit so we can be all inclusive and inform those that haven't seen it and let them know where. They can go back to HBC game day, Stephen Gaither, in terms of this one, to go get the full. But give a little framework about this. Uh, so uh, the Peak Sports representative, uh, an attorney representing Peak Sports, addressed the concerns over recent statements made by Dr. Skip Perkins, the athletic director at North Carolina Central. 
Um, in the letter, uh, he disputes, uh, he clarifies uh, some of the some of the company views and inaccuracies in comments about the contractual relationship between North Carolina Central and Peak Sports. Um, of course, we're all we're all the headline was the disputed claims about the 60 40 split for uh, advertising and so on and so forth. Yes. Or for contracts. And, and Drew and I got into the heavy debate about, uh, you know, if you bring in your own, why should you get 40 percent? You know, OK. OK. So we're all on the same page with that. Right. Um, Walker who was the, again, Cooper Walker, the attorney representing Peak Sports, outlined the actual terms of the agreement specifying that North Carolina Central retains 100% of revenue up to $100,000 annually, while Peak receives 100% of the revenue between $100,000 and $275,000. Revenue beyond 275,000 is shared with 60% going to central, 40% to peak. Okay, that's the first part. Now, the second part, he also clarified that although the original contract had such a clause, um, it was amended in May of 2023 to allow central to raise funds independently without owning or excuse me without owing a share to peak sports Ooh. this amendment signed by ad perkins <laughs> <clears throat> means that peak only earns from sponsorship it directly secures okay, yeah uh that's also which minute you read it before you said Perkins signed, I was like, "That's on the Perkins." Uh, look, hey, look, yeah, exactly, exactly, and oh, and he's gonna put it all on him. He signed like, it. No, that's him. He, he signed, signed it. it. Oh, wait, wait. There's more. What's the what's the ad say? Wait, more. there's more. Right. Uh, uh, regarding uh regarding the claim that Central has tried to exit the contract multiple times. The attorney provides details of a single conversation on a date in late April of 2024 where the AD inquired if Peak would allow Central to cancel the agreement. This was not followed up by any formal attempts or repeated discussions on the matter. Mm. Uh, so, yes, in the letter, Walker emphasized that Peak values its partnership with Central and holds no ill will towards the institution. The concern is specifically with Dr. Perkins' public statements, which have been circulated in various online forums, publications, and talked about on shows like ours, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that Pete does not intend to pursue legal actions provided the inaccuracies are rectified by the board's official records and addressed in the next board meeting. <laughs> Sounds like A.D. Perkins is going to have to come before the board and uh, give some clarifications. Uh, so there it is. Peak seeks to continue its collaborative efforts to support North Carolina Central Athletics, according to Walker, urging transparency and accuracy in public communications to maintain the integrity of their professional relationship. Um, HBCU Game Day reached out to North Carolina Central Athletics, but it declined comment. I told you that was the sexy. That was the sexy story. No, that's a good one. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Any thoughts after you read that? Uh, uh, someone got some explaining to do. Someone got some. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So, somebody. Any thoughts you got before we kind of close out on this? Because I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. And, and Brian, is is you bring up the revised uh, money financials of the of the agreement? I want to go back to something that was in that first article that I, that I quoted. So, Doctor Ingrid, Doctor Ingrid, thank you. So, the contract with Peak is. Not a new concept, but rather what is industry standard when yep. a school decides to outsource 
corporate sponsorships or, or ticket sales or marketing. To be more specific, Central submitted an RFP to find the best company to assist yep. with the sponsorship deal. Three companies submitted their, their bids through the North Carolina State Purchasing System. This was a decision made by several entities, our leaders on campus, and our leaders on campus, not just the AD. I think that's the other, that's probably the second most important thing oh, no in, in, in this article. Right. That they originally got into this, this was just a walk into the office, they put a piece of paper in front of you and sign it. They went through the process, and there were two other companies out there who had similar proposals to Central. Uh, to exactly said. like we said, these, these kind of things don't just happen in yeah, the dark or on right. a wheel. I thought y'all really did a good job of that Sunday, and I think that's the thing that uh, I would like the listeners and the viewers to understand, is that while these may not be things that you're comfortable with what are HBCUs or other programs for that matter, but these are not done willy-nilly. They may not be done... Uh, at the level that you like to see in terms of a percentage breakdown, but there's a lot of things that have to take place. Uh, we talked about this, that you can't just sign off on a contract. That's just state uh, law for most states. At least, at least on public institutions. institutions. In private, private institutions, it's right. a little bit different. And oftentimes, even with private institutions, I mean, they, they, they have, have some ethical policies yeah. that are similar to that because they're best practices. Correct. They may have some leeway, like in states, some states will require that you go with the lowest bid, Unless you can show some additional circumstances of why you don't want to go with that, especially in a private institution, you might ask for two or three bids, but you pretty much can choose. You don't have to worry about automatically going with the lowest bid. Yeah. So even with the private schools, they still have most of these some type of best practices and parameters going yeah. around where there's multiple folks involved about what that looks like. Um, so I think that's one of the things that comes out of this, outside of what Brian said. And what you said about some explaining you do and that this wasn't just a little A B, that it's bigger than that, that there's a lot of folks involved about that process of, of getting this thing done. I think I, I want to end on this. If we have learned anything since football season ended last year, Texas Southern, Florida AM, Central, other schools. If there's one thing that you all need to do as alumni and supporters of your institution, y'all need to get on these board meetings and get on the Zoom and follow these and follow these board meetings, follow these booster meetings, because all of this street committee barbershops talk that you hear, if you pay attention to those meetings, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, you would have known a lot of this stuff before it happened. And wouldn't be out here spreading these false rumors and making these false narratives. If, if you follow your institution like like you should. Or if you can't get on it, at least go to the minutes of the meeting if you can't be on it live. Great points. Great points made by all. With that, we'll take a second break and come back on the other side and let's get into it heavy. We'll get into the SIC announcements of predicted order of finish and some key players, defense, offensive players, preseason players of the year. I'm fascinated about that. We won't go too into depth too far with first and second team. You might have some key players that you want to point out and keep your eyes on. But stick with us. We'll be right back after this break as we get into the SIC hot and heavy. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is Always Ultra Thins reinvented with the Always Triple Protection System. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. 
We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. As technology continues to bring changes to the world of education, it's time we also reimagine teacher professional development. Gone are the days of one-size-fits-all learning that can only be accessed at a specific time and place. The Stride PD Center is an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that allow educators to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. The best professional development plans are those that include a level of flexibility and choice for educators. Whether you're a teacher, school, or district, visit us today to take charge of your learning. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Let's get into the SIEC. We got the predicted order of finish. I want to kind of save that for last. It's kind of juicy. The people always get excited about where their team was picked. And then from a media perspective, I want to see if you agree uh, with um, the SIED. This is my understanding uh, that while when we get into these players, the coaches made recommendations that the SID were actually want to do the selection. So that's a little different from conference to conference. Oftentimes, like in the SWAT MEAC, you basically have both the coaches and SIEDs voting uh, what that looks like, as well as Seattle. But in this case, I'm going to let you do uh, the brothers, if you would, the pleasures of listening. Who was the offensive player of the year and the defensive player of the year in terms of preseason ranking? Uh, Kylan. Doom, running back Lane, was uh, from Edgar, Louisiana. Redshirt Senior was selected as the offensive preseason player of the year. And the defensive preseason player of the year is Michael King, defensive back from Tuskegee, Alabama, who also attends Tuskegee University. And he's only a junior, and he's a true junior. I know you have a connection in many ways people don't realize with Tuskegee, but are you connected with this guy here? Michael King grew up, I was, I was former parts and rec director in Tuskegee, Alabama. And he played football in my program in, Tus in Tuskegee. I want to say, he had, I think he started as an eight-year-old with our program. Wow. And those teams won, uh, you know, league championships and everything. Not just him, but he was a... Uh, he was a special player uh, with those teams. Uh, and what's interesting to know about him as defensive player of the year, he started his college career on the offensive side of the ball as a wide receiver. Wow. Transitioned uh, to a kick returner and then became a starter last year on defense. And what does he do? Leads the conference in interception. <laughs> That's talent. And, I, uh, and I'm going to say this. Given that the Hall of Fame banquet is tomorrow, he may be the best defensive back to come out of Tuskegee since Frank Walker and Lawrence Drake were at were at Tuskegee on that 2014 when you had not one but two draft picks from the defensive backfield with the Golden Tigers. That's pretty nice. A lot of good accolades there. Ryan, I wanted to ask you this question. Before we get into it and talk about the predicted order of finish, I do want to kind of get your overall framework. You see players of the years oftentimes uh, because of what they do, talent, returning what they did the previous year. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that team is going to finish at the top of the conference um, in some cases. What are your thoughts in terms of the speed? I think they're likely going to be ranked for most people near the top. They lane. Uh, probably not. What are your thoughts in terms of players being selected as a offensive or defensive player of the year, first team or even second team for that matter, but particularly offensive player of the year, defensive player of the year, even if their team is not, not 
likely to be picked to be very strong. I would love, I would love to see the voting uh, numbers, Doc. You mean to tell me the the team? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I'm just trying to process what I'm watch, what I'm looking at here. Okay, um, the 2023 Offensive Player of the Year didn't graduate. All he did was move to another school with his coach. But you mean to tell me <laughs> that player, the top quarterback, first team preseason, is not the preseason player of the year? You mean you gave it to a running back who ran less than a thousand yards last year? I mean, you know, all respect to the brother, you know, uh, less than a thousand <laughs> yards, like nine, nine twenty eight. Close. And, uh, a close and eight touchdowns. Okay. He had, uh, I, I just want to make sure I get it right here. Let me see. One, two, three, four. He had four 100 yard games with his best day being 138 versus Edward Waters. I mean, now he did have a stretch where, let's see, two, three, four, five. He had a stretch of five straight games with at least one touchdown and he finished the season six of the last seven with a touchdown. But did you go see what David Wright did last year? Did anybody see what David Wright did? Y'all forgot about David Wright. So what did you wait, who, wait, who was the one singing David Wright's song at the beginning of the season? I next to I him. told y'all David Wright. You sure did. So what you have theoretically done, and I'm I'm sending this message to all of you SIDs who didn't vote, and you better hope the votes don't get out publicly. What you have essentially done <laughs> is you have given fuel, you've given a gas can and a lighter. To David Wright and he Coach Keaton, uh, you, you basically said, "No, nah, we didn't think you were worried of being the preseason offensive player." Do you? you remember, I mean, the guy who won it last year at the end of the year is not the preseason. <laughs> what, league, what kind of league is this? What league does that? What league does that, Doc? You've been doing this for how many years? What league does not return the guy who was your offensive player of the year? Who doesn't make him the pre? That's all right. Y'all mess around. Whoever's got to play Clark in the early what they parts, say, mess around and find out. you'll mess out and find out. I'm I'm calling now. He may have two thousand yards in the first three weeks of the season. That's what David Wright may do to y'all. I'm just letting you know you messed up, SIC uh, coaches uh, and SIDs, because there is no way in the world that David Wright should not be the preseason offensive player of the year. But hey, it's just preseason, Doc. What do we know? I like that. I'm gonna go to you on this one, Drew. In terms of the first team, second team. What are some couple of offensive people that we should keep our eyes on? Obviously, we named two of them. <laughs> we got a running back that was preseason player of the year, Kalen, and then we got a quarterback, David, David Wright, uh, in regards to uh, what Brian just talked about. What are some other key players that we need to keep our eyes on, uh, first team or offense, defense, that you said? And I'm trying, and, and, and I'm going on to see if this team has updated their roster for 2024. And they have not updated their roster for 2024. So somebody help me out with this. Does Kelvin Drum still play at Fort Valley? <laughs> I believe so. And he is transferring up. And he does not make either first team or second team. But if you want to talk about Brian not giving him respect, he was preseason of the preseason play of the year. Last year. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking What is going on in this league? What in the world? Look, I'm just giving y'all ample fuel to walk <laughs> into the media day and ask, what, what were y'all thinking? Who voted on this? Because there's going to be a lot of people <laughs> denying. There's going to be a lot of, watch this. There's going to be a lot of people denying. No, it wasn't me. I didn't vote. I voted for him. And you, by the time you do a count, you're going to say somebody lying. Half the, half the league lying about whether you did or did not vote for these guys. David Wright. Obviously, if, if if he's not preseason player of the year, first team quarterback, I have no yeah. problem with that. Okay. No disrespect to the quarterback at Savannah State. I'm Jay saying it's Adams, disrespectful. It's disrespectful. But had you heard that name before? Disrespectful with a capital D. Have you heard of Jake? Have you heard Jake Adams' name? <laughs> What did Savannah State finish last year? Yeah, yeah. What did Fort Valley finish last year? At the top. Where is Fort Valley in the predicted order of finish, which we're going to get to? Right. Compared to where is Savannah State in the predicted order of, of, of finish? Jaden. 
I mean, Kelvin Durham, one of the best two-way quarterbacks that you have in this league, not named David Wright. Mm -hmm. You said it all. I don't have a vote. I don't have a vote, and I'm glad I don't have a vote because I tell you what, I'm telling you who I would vote for. I've already told you who I'd vote for. It's on wax who I would vote for. You know, the question is, who did who did who did uh, these SIDs and coaches vote for? That's that's the amazing part to me. And and how did how do you determine player of the year? You know, it's like how do you what what do you have to have a certain number of votes? I mean, what determines player of Most the year? Most conferences, they just slide you in the slot, and then who, how many people don't return? Those are the people you get to vote on. But that in that first, that's that's the well, first that's team, what the second team. Started doing. Wax started doing that. If you were uh, finished the season, you automatically were going to be preseason, and then you voted. And on then, you vote, then you vote. Did you feel like that because this became such a problem? Which is why they implemented. Maybe you'll see the SI uh, see go to that movement. Uh, and part of this is probably all the transition from SIDs. Let's be honest. You yeah. can always talk about there are how many new ones and so some okay. of that is an issue. Uh, let's see. Savannah State doesn't have one. Albany State has a new SI SID this year. Morehouse has a new SID. Uh, the uh, Fort Valley is is up in the air. That's four I'm thinking of just off yeah. off the top of my head. Who were not there during football season last last year? So, so that's part of it, um, and so we need to keep our eye on it. But overall, I think your points are really well made, and you're right. It gives us some stuff to talk about, uh, if not asking around, which we will. But particularly when we get some of these interviews with the players, it's going to be interesting to see. Like you said, is that going to give them any motivation? Which you probably know it is, but are they going to be willing to talk about it? To me, it's going to be. Fast game to kind of see what kind of community we have. Let's take our last break. We'll come back on the other side. And I want to get into this predicted order of Phoenix and see what y'all talk about there. Stick with us. We'll be right back after our last break. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and parenting education coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational. Powerhouse, intelligent and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K E A V E R S V O I C E dot com. Covers voice, covers voice, covers voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot of laugh and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes, sir. Yes, sir. and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bills inside the HBC Sports Lab uh, with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. They're out on assignment. Um, Charles is probably on the plane getting here. We'll catch up with him, be ready for us to get going in the morning. But I have my other partners with me, uh, the duo associated with Sports Right, uh, uh, Sports Rap, I should say. On BCSN, that's AD Drew and Brian. Brian and AD, a sports rap. With that being said, let's get into this predicted order of finish. This is where it really gets interesting. I mm -hmm. like these kind of things, right? Because everybody in their right mind can do their own predicted order of finish. Uh, number 13. Let me start as I like to go from top to bottom, kind of do it as a tease as I tell everybody to do it. Number 13 is Morehouse. No chance. Number 12 is Lane, new coach, new program, struggle. Same coach. With the player of the year. I thought the new coach came in for Morehouse in terms of. Oh, Morehouse, I thought you yeah. said Lane. Yeah. yeah, Lane is number 12. I'm sorry. Player of the year that y'all discussed. Coach coming back, number 12. Can you be minute. player of the year on a. That's why I asked. Apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> number 11, <laughs> Allen. Andre Dawson. Did you talking about going from the top to the bottom? Uh, top. Third, top quarter, the bottom quarter, if you're looking at it like this. You're talking about a huge turnaround. 
They did lose the coach, lost a lot of players, including a quarterback that Brian believes should have been preseason offensive player of the year. Um, and so it might be BCSN's Division Two player of the year. We'll see how that looks like. And number 10, Clark Atlanta. I'm kind of surprised that they're this low. Interesting, interesting with that is the same team, Allen, who was what they finished four, number five in the league last yeah. year. Yeah. yeah. Whose players went to Clark Atlanta, dropped out of town because they <laughs> lost. Who it. finished? Who, who you don't, finished? You don't give Clark Atlanta credit for all the players coming over. But actually, if you look at it mathematically, Allen was five. Clark Atlanta was number thirteen last year, so it's like math back when they didn't split the difference. I put them right there in ten. Maybe I'm sorry, <laughs> maybe so. Number nine is Central State, and number eight Savannah State, and number seven is Kentucky State. This is pretty mathematically right halfway. So I'm gonna stop there uh, to put a put in. Are any of the bottom seven? We we'll start with you, Drew. That you think are totally ranked too low. I'm going. I'm going. Can I get two? Yes. Okay. I I've already said what I said about about Clark Atlanta. I think they they'll finish closer to 500 in the conference. They'll be middle of the road this year, probably a year away from contention. Pay attention to Central State. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it on Sunday show. We did the strength of schedule. Based on opponents' records from oh, last that. season, and yeah, we have that graphic here. We we'll get time; we'll get into it. But Central State has the second easiest strength of schedule based upon last year's last year's opponents' record in conference, and they finished four and four last year. So mm-hmm. you would expect them with the easy schedule, finishing five hundred, that they would pick up a game or two this year. Good stuff. Let me go to you, Brian. Any of those bottom seven, Morehouse Lane, Allen, Clark Atlanta, Central Savannah State, and Kentucky in reverse order from 13 to 7, any of those teams, and you can pick two or three, are too low. I, I'm going to – I wasn't thinking about Central State, but I'm glad Drew brought that up because I'll i I'll fall in line and uh, and say that's, that's good. Um, I was just kind of Central State was the median last season. They finished four and four, and they were in the in the eight spot. So where I was going is I was wondering, you know, if you're saying that eight is five hundred, you know, because eight was five hundred last year. Um and there was no and, and and you know the difference between eight and nine was a two game difference. So pretty much, if you finished nine or under, you were pretty much a two win or lower win team last year. Mm, great point. Okay, so I I think what's interesting I would say in that case I think Clark is too low because I think Clark will be a five hundred team this year again. I think there's something to be said about having what I believe is not only the best quarterback, mm-hmm. but you have a coach and quarterback. You have a quarterback going to a system he already knows just at a new school, probably maybe with some few familiar faces joining him on the offensive side of the ball. But at least he knows the plays. There's nothing new Clark is going to do or run that they haven't done previously. So I I'm gonna say Clark is too low, and I'll I'll roll with AD on that on the Central State being too low. I, I I like that I like that I'm gonna give you my predicted order and finish, but before we do that, I want to give you the top six Ooh. and see how much you agree with the top six. You already basically tell me there's two teams you don't think should be here. See, well, let me let me give them first, uh, and then uh, it sounds like. You, Brian, you know at least one of them is not going to be in here. And then you were saying you would agree with Drew that you're probably right as two of them. Let's see how much of that holds true. Because you always can tell. But at the top six, you got number six, Edward Wallace. Uh, 
President Faison has already said that they were too low. <laughs> and somebody else's fault. And I think they would pick five in that one. So you What's know that strength of schedule? Has yeah, he looked at that strength of schedule? I don't, I don't think Doc has uh, looked at that strength of schedule, though. It's pretty I tough. I agree with you. We're going to pull that up right after this. At number five, we have Benedict. Uh, I think they're high. That is I do, too. In I terms of high. losing a coach and all that they left, I think people are very generous uh, to yep. see that they – and I think they got a lot to prove. Uh, so I'm interested. That's one team I can see I'm pushing that. I want to see if y'all agree with that. But number four is Tuskegee. Uh, when we get in the discuss, when we get in the schedule, Too certainly low. you can see uh, that that is generous. People might say they may be a little higher than that. And number three, Miles. A lot of folks like that coach and like what they're coming back. Number four, Valley State. Number two, who's right there in Albany State. I think pretty much, pretty much, mostly universal about them being number one. When you talk about having a monkey on your back <laughs> in terms. Of most people, there are a couple people out there that make an argument. I'm not saying that. But just for the most people, a lot of folks like what I'm going to say. Even if you don't have a number one, you probably have two or three. So with that being said, I'm going to start with you this time, Brian, and come back to you, AD. What are your thoughts in the top six? Are you still in the same framework? There's a team or two that you want to put out of this. And if so, what is that team? Or two? The SIC is so predictable. I mean, we, it, it is because we, I mean, y'all so predictable. We It's back to the same four schools that we are familiar with from, you know, Benedict coming on the scene and doing what they did was sort of, remember the first year Benedict went unbeaten, they weren't predicted to finish one or two. They kind of. I, they didn't. They they. I won't. They, they, they were the five hundred team. Predicted. They were the five hundred team that every that caught that supposedly, if you want to say, caught everybody surprised. Caught everybody surprised. Then the they following caught, year, they caught everybody, everybody so much by surprise. They were on five different homecomings that year. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And then everybody realized, oh no, that's a good team. We we're gonna vote them number one, and they backed it up. So now, what happens? Benedict falls back into what they were prior to coming into um the 2022 season so and and what that means is the standard is the standard in the sic albany state fort valley state miles and tuskegee i just you know i kind of questioned the order of it um I, you know i i told you i think for i knew fort valley would be one of the top two teams i wasn't surprised by that and i think for tuskegee to be four is a little bit surprising to me. I, I at maybe three, three. And we're talking three difference between three and four. We're talking semantics, right? But basically, essentially, what that's saying is Miles will beat Tuskegee because what it came down to a game a year ago, right? Between it all came these down to that game, right? It came down to a game uh, between all of these teams that finished uh, six and two. So that's essentially what they're saying. And I don't think that's going to happen this year. So I would at least have Tuskegee three. Me personally, I probably have Fort Valley as the number one team in Tuskegee number two. That that's how I would vote if I had a vote. But there's a reason they don't let a guy like me have a vote. Good one, good one. Ad Drew, where are you in terms of the top six? So let me ask this: Make sure you're clear. I didn't clear this. Which of the top six? Who are you putting out? Uh Benedict. Got it. Right. Where are you in terms of your top six? A, Fort Valley. Albany State was lucky to be in that championship game last year. Mm -hmm. Fort Valley blew a fourth quarter lead against Albany State in the Fountain City Classic. Fort Valley should have been the representative to go against Benedict in the SIAC championship game. Mm -hmm. The only reason, if, even if Fort Valley wins, if Tuskegee beats Miles, Tuskegee is in there. Tuskegee was the one team out of the four that was going in on that day that controlled their own destiny, and they laid it in. Point blank. Tuskegee laid it in. Now, it's interesting. One, two, three, four. It's going to come down to that, that last game. The Fountain City Classic, homecoming for Tuskegee. 
that it, it, I really do think it's going to go out there. Ever Waters, I think it's the team that definitely ahead of Benedict could be could be that team on that last day. I believe they played Fort Valley that day. Mm. Might mean something that they are probably right now they have the easiest opponent. On the last day of the season of all these teams, we talking about their contention. Preseason, y'all. Preseason, no disrespect. I think Tuskegee's gonna be high. Tuskegee's gonna be in the top two. Why do I think Tuskegee's gonna be on the top two? Only three teams on their schedule, conference wise, finished above five hundred last year. If we get that graphic up with the uh, strength of schedule. There you see it. Easiest strength of schedule. The opponents in conference had a 328 winning percentage last year. Who does Tuskegee not play this year? Oh, Albany State. Nice. Fort Valley. Nice. Benedict and Allen. <laughs> they've, no. got, they've got the easiest road to get there. Why do I say Central State is too low? Look at that. I've got Tuskegee, Fort Valley, top two. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Uh, in terms of that graphic, based on that graphic, this is my predicted order of minutes. I want to share with everybody. Go ahead and get this out officially before tomorrow. Uh, we'll have this on the show as we break it down. But this is what I decided based on the strength of schedule. Based on get the predicted order finish, based on what I've studied, based on asking you all questions, I do agree I have 13 uh, with Morehouse. I think they're going to struggle. Uh, I think there's a lot to prove there. We can take the graphic down and we'll get back to it. Um, at number 12, uh, we have Allen. At number 11, I have Savannah State. I have them pretty low compared to what maybe other things. I think there are a lot of things over there. A lot of question marks that I'm looking at. At number 10, you have Kentucky State. At number nine, you have Lane. At number eight is Central State. Now this is Dr. Cavill's uh, predicted order uh, of finish in terms of what I get out there. At number uh, nine, like I said, I had Lane. Number eight, Central State. Now I'm gonna get in trouble for about the phase line. I got Edward Waters at seven. Benedict at six. At five, I have Fort Valley State, so I'm really off in terms of where y'all think. Uh, Fort Valley. Fort Valley yeah. Five. I think the surprise that I got that I think a lot of people are not going to get, I believe in Clockett Valley. I believe in Coach. I believe in that quarterback. I think they're going to surprise stuff. I have them at four, uh, but they would be my surprise to win the conference. Would not surprise me. And number three, I have Tuskegee, which is probably a little lower. I think there's still some question marks I have. I think the schedule is going to put them in a really good position to maybe play for the championship. But I'm not sure. I think they're a year away from getting it done, and they might they might give up a game they're not supposed to give up, which wouldn't surprise me, right? The number two miles, I like what the coach is doing down there. I think they're going to be in the mix. And number one, I do have Auburn State. I'm in agreement with that. But again, the team that I'm saying keep your eyes on. If I have to pick a spoiler. Me pick to get in there. Well, come on, come on, come on. Who's your Who's your shock world team, Brian? Shock. Uh, define what is this shock the world? Never won the team. Like like Benedict was two years ago. They shocked the world. No, no yeah. one expected Benedict to come out of anywhere. Doctor Bill said Clark is his team this year. Who's your mm -hmm. of all of these teams here? That if it's not the team Albany or Fort Valley, if it's not one of those, if it's not one of those four blue bloods, who's your shock the world team? I, I like what Doc said. I'm gonna go with Clark from the standpoint of they got the best quarterback in the. Give, give me the team with the best quarterback going playing with a familiar coach, and uh, yeah, that that's the team. I think uh, if, if we're talking about shocking people and and upsetting the apple cart, that's who I'll go with. I'm gonna go left. Well, not too far left. Actually, I'm gonna go right. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the Atlantic Ocean, and I'm and I'm gonna pull yeah. one of the many titles we got in this conference. Yeah, but but the uh, purple and orange. 
I'm gonna pull Evan Waters as my shock the world team this year. You like just break, what did you just pick? You just put them as what sixth? What did you just say they were? No, that, not, that, that was me. No, that was no, no, what, what, what did you have? The, I, I think this is one of the leagues in there. If you talk about your shot, if you shot, you're talking about a team that's gonna probably get three or four more wins than you than everybody thinks they're gonna get, which means that puts them in a position to be at the top. Um, so that's kind of to me what you mean. Shock is this a team that gives you a three, four more wins than what you uh, necessarily thought they were giving you in the first. Ever Waters will be playing for an opportunity the last Saturday of the season. Ooh, I like that. But they they did that last year. No, that, they were that, out of it last year. They were out. Well, of okay, they were out two of it two weeks before. Two weeks. Ago, two weeks. Okay, okay, so two one weeks ahead of the last yeah. week. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. But that that's uh, your 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 definition of shocking is. But it's the, uh, Brian, remember that. I thought you would say like number Central five, State. Number five team. If you said Central State, that would be shocking. That would be shocking. Yeah. But there were five teams last year who had a mathematical chance of getting in the last Saturday of the season last year. And Edward Waters was one of them. No, they were not one. They were number All right. six. All right, hey, hey, hey guys, we gotta get out of here. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this. I'm sorry. After you watch O and on Wednesday, after you watch Dr. Camille's inside APC Fourth Lab on Thursday, don't forget game time tomorrow. Oh, and make sure you check out Game Time Live. <laughs> Breakfast, do that. Breakfast, Breakfast with BCSN. Yes, uh, get that in. And so after you watch that on Wednesday, after you watch Strike Zone to close out your Wednesday night, after you close out your Thursday night with Dr. Camille's inside the HBC Sports Lab. Saturday with Carlos Brown. Make sure you catch these guys because they're gonna continue this conversation <laughs> on Sunday night. We got the kids are going to show. That's with much be. exact with much much more. They're gonna give it to you in terms of that. And look for some big things to come out of BCSN. We're gonna hit the road, and we always hit the road. Usually when we hit the road, we're just providing you the games. This time we're gonna hit the road not only. In many cases, provide you some game, HBC game that you can always get at the BCSN that you can't necessarily get anywhere else in terms of what we're proud to produce and provide you from Roy in terms of what he's always done. But we're looking at adding uh, some additional um, broadcast and entertainment uh, programming for you that will lead up and be some game day. Uh, opportunity also some live uh, game events where we be uh traveling across the hbc landscape the sporting hbc dash to give that so keep your eyes on that that information is soon to come in a lot of ways we might be kicking that off uh in terms of the lee Swag challenge so we'll look for that to come kind of as a tease i kind of put that out there maybe ahead of the ski but we'll see what that looks like officially with that being said thank you for listening inside the hbc sports lab Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Kaville, the Dean of HBC Sports. I'm back, at least for the media. We'll see what that means in August. And they're going to give me some time back. Certainly, I look forward to the fall. We got some big news we're looking at doing inside the HBC Sports Lab. We're going to see if we can stretch this out and give you some more coverage, more days of the week. We'll see what that looks like. See if my check checkbook will hold that because I got to. See if I can negotiate with some of these folks. You see what these ABs are telling you out there. So I got people like that too, and these folks like to get paid. And I'm not sure if I uh, have saved up enough to put them on the employment list. With that being said, you see what happened when they brought up Roy yesterday uh, and they asked the question. Well, never mind. I don't want to get anybody. <laughs> uh, Mike and Charles will be back with us to look at them as they're moving around and getting things done. Uh, we still have B.J. Jones and Joshua Sims. Look for them to get things going again with X's and O's on HBC Weekly, uh, HBC Nightly, HBC Basketball Nightly. Is, uh, before you know it, basketball season is going to be in here. But before we get too far in that, we're going to catch you up with all your news and walks on the HBCU. Look for us to be at many of the HBCU media days. We're going to try to make them all. We'll certainly be at the SWAC. I plan to be at the MEAC. Um, we'll see if we can get somebody down to the CIAA. We'll see what that looks like. Again, we hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you see, enjoyed me back in the captain chair. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Rockford Bills Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Wild and Charles Bishop. Obviously, the guest of the uh, day is 80 Drew and Brian Fulford. With that being said, check us out for breakfast 
tomorrow morning as we get you going for your HBC football media days with the SIC football media day Hall of Fame banquet. As we're getting done, we're going to get over there and see if we can shake some hands and make some things happen. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Wash and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time, uh, as well as we'll get back to our Sunday show at 9 a.m. as we get into the football season. We look forward uh, to next week as we discuss uh, the latest in the lab. Uh, with that being said, Follow me, Dr. Yadaville, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L, inside the HBC Sports Lab, one on X, formerly known as Twitter. I like to still call it Twitter. It's just what I do. Inside the HBC Sports Lab on YouTube. Obviously, with BCSN on YouTube, many of y'all out there following. Thank you. Shout out to all our lab listeners engaging and getting that information out there. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. With that being said, Brian? Of course. AD? Great to have you back, Doc. Lecture dismissed.